morning to everybody. It is a pleasure to be back in uh, South Africa. Um, this is my fifth trip in uh, almost four decades. Uh, my first trip was in 1987-88, and I was here uh, exactly in Sun City. At that time, it was Borhu Taswana. It was, it was one of the homelands, and actually I was classified as Asian because there were four uh, races during apartheid, and they looked at me and they said, you don't look too white, but you don't look black, so if you are not white and you are not black, you cannot be colored, therefore, we will write that you are Asian, Indian. So, I became an Indian here in South Africa. Uh, anyway, I don't want to talk about the sad past, because they have been many times back in uh, South Africa and I have seen the incredible changes in uh, this beautiful country. And all over Africa. I lived uh, three years uh, in Africa and I have visited 35 African countries. So I think I know a lot about the continent. And I have moved, when I was here, I was working in the energy industry. I was in the petroleum industry. Now I am into the longevity industry, which is more exciting than the energy industry. I coordinate at the group of Spain and Latin America for the Millennium Project that began as the futuristic part of the United Nations, even though now it is an independent NGO. And we have what we call nodes throughout the planet, including several nodes uh, in Africa. We have people working with us in Egypt, in uh, Uganda, in uh, uh, Tanzania, in Kenya, and here in South Africa. We have several people in Pretoria, in Johannesburg, and also in Stellenbosch University near Cape Town. So I have been to all those places where we have been working on strategies for the future, including a strategy for South Africa in the future. The Millennium Project, we, walk, uh, we talk about the global challenges of humanity and we produce reports. This is the latest that you can download for free. It is, uh, what will the year 2050 be like? And three scenarios. In one of those scenarios, uh, we will have bases on the moon and on planet Mars, the space bases, and also we will be immortal. Uh, so we talk about this openly, we presented this uh, at the United Nations in New York, and also regional reports. I coordinated one about Latin America in the year 2030, uh, which I had the pleasure to present at the World Economic Forum that you might know, Davos, uh, in Switzerland, and we talk about the trends of humanity. In fact, we do forecasts for humanity, and these are the forecasts uh, of population. And you can see the population of the planet began growing very fast in the 20th century. And uh, it is still growing fast in Africa. If you look at the different parts of the world, Africa uh, will soon overtake uh, China and India as the most populous region in the planet, while other parts of the world, actually the population is declining, like Europe, where I live, Russia, or Japan. So China, uh, going down, it's reaching a peak next year and then it begins a horrible demographic implosion. China is going to lose over 700 million and Nigeria will overtake uh, China in terms of population according to the latest forecast by the year 2100. Of course, probably that will not happen because the future is unknown and many things are happening. But anyway, these are the population forecast to the year 2050 that we do with the Millennium Project and the United Nations. But more interesting than the population forecast that is growing linearly and stabilizing is the economic projections. And this is really, really fascinating because it is growing exponentially. If you look at the vertical scale, it is a logarithmic scale that implies an exponential increase in uh, GDP per capita, gross domestic product. Uh, until the 18th century, the income per capita around the globe was around $1,000 per person per year. But this changed beginning with the Industrial Revolution. And the first countries that industrialized grew very fast. Europe, North America. But now the whole planet is catching up. And we move, as you can see, from $1,000 uh, in the year 1800 uh, to $10,000 uh, 
some time ago, and we are going to reach $100,000 per person per capita. Because the economy, I repeat, is growing exponentially. If you still don't believe this, take a look at the Dow Jones Industrial Index, which is the most famous stock exchange in the world, and it has been growing exponentially for over two centuries. It doesn't matter COVID, it doesn't matter World War I, World War II, the economy is growing exponentially. That is why humanity is in this incredible period of growth. And this all began with the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom. England was the first country in the history of humanity that doubled its income per capita. And it took 58 years, between 1780 to 1838. Then other countries learned even faster, the USA, only in 47 years. And now the world record is China, seven, eight, nine years. But India is catching up with um, China, and African countries will too soon. You can see the example I like to give Japan. Japan was a very poor country a generation ago, and then now it's a world power in terms of technology and other areas. But again, it, this all began with the Industrial Revolution. Um, around the year 1800. Until then, we were caught in what is called the Malthusian Trap. The Malthusian Trap, because of Malthus, uh, he said that it was the end of humanity. We had too many people and we had no resources and the world could not grow. But Malthus was wrong. And actually, because of the Industrial Revolution, the economy of the planet grew, as you can see, 100% in the 19th century. century. 400% in the 20th century, and in this century, the economy is going to grow thousands and thousands percent. We are in the most incredible time of economic development in the planet, and Africa is rising with this. We are actually moving from a world of scarcity into a world of abundance. Every time we produce more and more with less and less resources, and this will make uh, rise the income of everybody. But there are groups that oppose technology. Probably you are familiar with the Amish. They live in the 18th century, which has nothing special, except for the fact that that is when they moved from Europe into North America. And they don't want technology after the 18th century. Other groups, like I grew up in South America, we have some very famous Indian communities uh, called the Yanomami. The Yanomami live like they lived 5,000 years ago. They don't want any technology. They don't even use clothes, which also has advantages, of course. But, uh, you know, they live like they were living 5,000 years ago. They do not want any technology, not even clothes. And I am sure that 5,000 years ago, we had the anti-will movement. <laughs> People who didn't want the will, even though it was one of the greatest inventions of humanity. But let's go back to the Industrial Revolution, because it, when it began in England, there were people against it. The Luddites. The Luddites wanted to destroy the machines, because they said that the machines would take away their jobs. Fortunately, the machines won, and that is why we live in such an advanced world today, thanks to the machines, thanks to technology, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, even though the Luddites were against it. And now we have the Neo-Luddites, also against technology. But we need to keep on moving with technology forward. Because the Neo-Luddites, look at that. Luddite computer. You know, they want to go back into the past, into the abacus. Anyway, the whole world is changing. And you have probably seen this map for a long, long time. Because this is the map that was uh, taken uh, from Europe to the world. Obviously centered in Europe. Uh, it is so popular that even some cows have, have this map. <laughs> But actually, I recommend that you look into the world centered in China. Because China, if you can read Chinese, China has two characters. The first character means middle, and the second, kingdom. China, in Chinese, is the middle kingdom. China is the center of the world. And as of to now, one out of every five people is Chinese. Of course, this will change because Africa is rising, but still the Chinese the Japanese, the Koreans, look at the world centered on China. This is all relative, of course, because the world is spherical. And uh, if you are in Australia, you actually look at the world upside down. Or if you are in Dubai, you look at the world islands. 
My objective is that you look at the world with a new face and also with a new behind. <laughs> because we are finally moving out of this planet. And I am very happy to tell you I was part of the first Spanish simulated, simulated mission to go to Mars. We were, just before the pandemic, thank you, thank you, I was one of the five chosen Spanish astronauts to go to Mars. And I did a program with National Geographic. You can watch me on TV one day on Mars, talking about this. But you know, the person that will take us to Mars is a South African, Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the one who is going to beat NASA. He's going to beat the Russians. He's going to beat the Chinese. And we are going to go to Mars thanks to a South African. Um, in, 19, in 2009, I was one of the founding faculty of Singularity University. You probably have heard about it because we have a, a, a big community actually in Johannesburg from Singularity University alumni. And we talk about the singularity, about immortality and about all these things, which are based on the idea of my friend Ray Kurzweil, who is also a graduate of MIT, my alma mater, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he says that by the year 2045, man becomes immortal. But for the women here, don't worry. <laughs> Ladies will become immortal too. Everybody will become immortal, of course. Um, this is how Singularity University was structured to solve all the world problems, food, education, water, security, health, etc., etc. And our students make uh, startup ventures. They begin with companies to solve these problems. And I am very proud that some of my students in the year 2010, they created this company called Made in Space that put the first 3D printer in space. And 3D printing in space is not easy because there is no gravity and things don't fall because there is no gravity in space. However, they created a technology to be able to 3D print in space. Anyway, all of this is going to happen. All of these technologies will be reaching a height in 2045. Like Ray Kurzweil talks in his book, The Singularity is Near. But the singularity is a very interesting concept. I like to define it as the moment, the time, when artificial intelligence reaches human intelligence. And so that you do not sleep tonight, that will be the end of the human age. The end of the human age that we know. But so that you sleep tomorrow night, it will be the beginning of the post-human age, the post-human age of immortal humans, super-intelligent humans, humans that will be throughout the solar system. Ray Kurzweil just sent me the, his latest book, the manuscript to review, The Singularity is Nearer, that will be published next year. In this book, he actually ratifies his forecast, his prediction, that by 2045, we will reach the singularity and immortality. And I hope that all of you will be alive by, by then, because you look young enough and strong enough to be alive for the next 23 years to see the future and the beginning of the post-human age. Most people don't understand this or don't believe it, but that's because they don't think about what happened, the history. You know, 40 years ago, I began studying computer computing science with this. These are the famous punch cards. This had 10 by 100. 10 by 100 is how much? A thousand. Even lawyers know that, right? A, th a thousand. 1K. 1K. This was 1K of memory. And you had to make a small holes all night, making holes. And this you could not erase, because once you made holes, you could not erase. And so, a new type of memory was developed. The electromagnetic memories. And I have the first generation, which were 8 inches big. Also, 1K, 1K. Uh, I like to say, in Spanish, the letter K is pronounced K. So I say, 1K plus 1K is 1KK. 1KK. 40 years ago, we just had one caca of technology. 
But look at the incredible changes. We went from one caca to 512 cacas, <laughs> then to 1.4 mega cacas, and now here I have a pen drive of one tera. I have a pen drive of one terabyte. In 40 years, we have gone from caca to terabytes. What do you think will happen in the next 20 years? In the next 20 years, you will remember me, and you will remember caca. But this will be caca. One terabyte will be caca in 20 years, because we will have more memory in a small device than we have neurons in our brain in the next 20 years. As you can see, from cacas to terras and much more in the next 20 years. Technology is changing exponentially, faster, smaller, cheaper and better. But we do not understand this because we think linearly. But technology is changing exponentially and there is an incredible change with exponential rates. For example, if I give 30 linear steps, each step 1 meter, after 30 steps I have walked 30 meters. But if I walk exponentially and I double, I double, I double, after 30 doublings I have gone around the planet 26 times and I have walked over a billion meters. How many of us can understand this? We don't understand this because we think linearly. But I repeat, technology changes exponentially. So get ready for an exponential future. But not only with computers, also with biotechnology and medicine. The Human Genome Project began in 2000, in 1990, 1990, and it finished 13 years later in 2003. That means it cost, uh, it took 13 years and it cost just the US government over $1 billion. Today, in 2022, you can sequence your genome for less than $100 in one hour. And I'm pretty sure very, few, very soon you will sequence your complete genome for about $10 in one minute. This is incredibly exponential. This is more exponential than what is happening with caca. Remember caca? Well, this is a caca compared to what is happening in biotechnology and medicine. It's changing even, even faster. And at the end, we are only, in terms of a genome, we are only three gigabytes of data. Three gigabytes, all of us, biologically. Remember how much this is? This is one terabyte, one terabyte. How many humans can I put in one terabyte if we are only three gigabytes of data? Scientists developed artificial life in the year 2000, a virus first, a virus. But a virus is a small, it has very few genes, in 2000. In 2010, a bacteria was developed, an artificial bacteria. Bacteria are bigger and have more genes. If this continues, by 2045, we will get to the three gigabytes of human data we will be able to create human artificial genomes. Just to show you how this is incredible, um, this is, um, let me show you the partial sequence of my genome, partial so that you don't know everything about me. Um, you can see, once you sequence your genome, and all of you will have your genome sequenced in five to 10 years, all of you, and you will know the probability of you dying of any disease the probability of you having cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, etc. Isn't this exciting to know what you might die of so that you do not die of that, okay? So you will know your genome, but not only the diseases, you will know where you come from. And look where I come from in the last thousand years. This is my paternal life according to my genome, you can see uh, my ancestors from Spain, but all the way to Mongolia in Asia. And on the bottom right, you can see that one of my great ancestors is Genghis Khan. So no one mess around with me. <laughs> this is on my father's line. Let me show you my mother's line. And on my mother's line, I come from Maria Antoinette. So I have a good pedigree between Genghis Khan and Maria Antoinette. 
all of you will know this uh, when you sequence your genome. Obviously, this is about a thousand years, okay? If I go a hundred thousand years, I am African because we are all Africans. We evolved in Africa. Once you sequence your genome, you will be able to verify if your father is really your father. <laughs> but that is not important. It is more important to know the future, not to know the past. So let me tell you some bad news. You are all here by mistake, because you were not designed. In the future, we will design our children. This is an experiment I did with one of my students at Singularity University. We shared genes. Uh, this is a theoretical experiment. We shared genes to see how our children would be. And then select the genes that you want for your children. This will be a standard in the next two decades. You are the last human generation that has not been designed. The level of knowledge is increasing exponentially, and in the last two decades, we have created more knowledge than in all of previous history together. And humanity has gone through three major revolutions. The agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the intelligence revolution, and now we are getting into the fourth revolution, which is the future even more interesting. Also, life spans are increasing. At the time of the Roman Empire, the life expectancy, average life expectancy, was between 20 and 25. All of us, I think, would be dead here, on average. I would be dead two times and a half, okay? Uh, but I am not dead, and I am full of life, and even more, I don't plan to die. You know, because life expectancy might reach a hundred years by 2040. But also, look what is increasing. What is increasing is the time in education. That is why we are advancing so much. We are learning and creating more than ever in human history. And we will have more and more education in the future. I grew up in South America, in Venezuela, and the biggest company of Venezuela on the left is the Petroleos de Venezuela, the Venezuelan oil company, which is very big. But Mickey Mouse sells more than all the oil in Venezuela, or his company, Walt Disney. We are moving from the world of manufacturing into the world of mine factoring. Mine factoring. The industries of the future are the industries of the mind. Creativity, imagination, not raw materials, not uh, physical resources. Another example from a country next to Venezuela, Colombia. Colombia has the symbol of its exports, who is a, a person called Juan Valdez that grows coffee. And Colombia, on the best times in history, sells about two billion dollars of coffee. Two billion dollars of coffee. But a Starbucks sells ten times more. The the important thing is not the raw material, it's to add value, to add value like a Starbucks does to the Colombian coffee. There is a disruption in every sector, in every industry, in every company. Today, Uber is the largest taxi company in the world, and it does not own a single car. Facebook is the largest media com uh, company, and it doesn't really have media people. Alibaba and Amazon in the USA are the largest retailers in history and they don't really have products and Airbnb is the largest hotel chain in the world and they don't own a room. At Singularity University we talk about exponentially changing world, world and we say Uber yourself before you get caught at. So we really need to think that we need to transform ourselves or we will be caught at. Futurists talk about four ways to think about the future. The worst one is to be passive, like an ostrich. So I hope we don't have ostriches here that hide your head on the ground and don't want to see the future. A little bit less bad is to be reactive, like a firefighter that comes when there is a fire. 
It is much better to be preactive, like when you buy insurance to prevent any problems. But the best way is to be proactive, because we can create the future, we can design the future, we can visualize good scenarios and how to get there, and better scenarios and how to avoid them. So I really hope we have no ostriches in this room. But if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches to fly and see the future. Um, about 15 years ago, I had the pleasure to visit uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke in his home. And he was a great visionary who wrote many books about the future science fiction. He was actually an engineer. He was an electric engineer from England, even though he became famous because of science fiction. And he wrote the three laws of the future when I was born. He said, first law of the future, when a famous scientist says that something is possible, he's probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law of the future, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past those limits into the impossible. And third law of the future, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And we are going to see magic in the future. In the next two decades, we are going to see more technological changes than in the previous two millennia. I repeat so that you understand the magnitude of the shock, of the disruption. In the next 20 years, more technological changes than in the last 2,000 years of human history. For example, 30 years ago, personal computers were beginning. Actually, I graduated from the most important technological university in the world, MIT, and my thesis was written on an old technology called typewriter. I don't know if you have seen typewriters. I used that primitive technology at MIT to write my thesis. 20 years ago, cell phones were becoming all over the world. 10 years ago, Google, Facebook around the planet. So what will happen in the next 20, 30 years? We are going to see magic. We are going to control aging, reverse aging, and reach immortality. In fact, immortality has been the biggest and the first and the most important dream of humanity since we know. The first book in human history, almost 5,000 years old, the Epic of Gilgamesh in Mesopotamia, is about immortality. The second of this book, the Book of the Death in Egypt, is about immortality. The Chinese emperor, Qin Shi Huang, that unified China for the first time and created the Terracotta Army, wanted to be immortal. The Spanish, when they discovered America, they were looking for the fountain of eternal youth. Even the Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. But we did not have the technology until today. Today is that we are finally understanding that this is possible. And now in the terms of the pandemic, look at the situation. The people who die from COVID are mostly elderly people. And the older you are, the highest probability of you dying. And COVID is really a small pandemic. It's nothing in historic terms, nothing. The Black Death killed one out of three Europeans. 33% of Europe died because of the Black Death. So COVID, what is COVID? COVID is a chance game. It's nothing in historic terms. But not only the Black Death, a smallpox, a Spanish flu, which by the way was not a Spanish. The Spanish flu came from the USA, not from Spain. And many other many other diseases like HBI AIDS that is reaching close to 40 million people. So COVID is really a small pandemic. However, it has paralyzed the planet. So if a small pandemic paralyzes the planet, imagine what we have to do against aging. Because all of us are suffering from aging. You are aging. You are dying. All of us are dying. And now we understand that aging is the center, the mother of all diseases. We have to move from sick care into health care, where aging is the main cause of all other diseases. Based on these ideas, you can see actually reality. 
for all diseases, the number one risk factor is age. It is not drinking, it is not dancing, it is not smoking, it is age. When you are 20, you don't get Alzheimer's, you don't get heart attacks, but the older you grow, exponentially the chances of you dying of any of these diseases. In fact, if we could cure all cancers, we could only extend lifespan three years because you would die of something else. If you cure heart trouble, you expand your life for years, but then you could die of something else. If you cure cancer and heart disease, you extend seven years, but it's if you die. But if we slow aging, we will live for decades and decades. And so, my British co-author, David Wood, who studied at Cambridge, Cambridge, England, I studied at Cambridge, Massachusetts, we decided to write a book about this. And we published it in Spanish, my mother tongue, and my book was number one and number five bestseller at the same time. Number one in paper and number five in Kindle format. Since then, why, why in Spain? Because Spain has the second longest life expectancy in the planet, only after Japan among the major countries. Japan has a life expectancy of about 85 and a half years, as Spain has a life expectancy of 84 and a half years. Even the USA is only 79. So Spain is actually an aging society, rapidly aging society. So it was a major success in Spain and all over Latin America, from Mexico to Argentina. And I even created a political movement about this called Miel. Miel in Spanish means honey. And I got 7,000 votes for the European Parliament. In a quick campaign of a couple of months, 7,000 votes. I needed more to be a member of the European Parliament, but it was not a bad beginning. And my idea is to change the logo, the motto of Spain, that used to be non plus ultra until 1492, when America was discovered, because Spain was the end of the Roman Empire, and there was nothing beyond Spain. When America was discovered, we changed the motto to plus ultra, far beyond. But now, my objective is to call it Vita Plus Ultra, life far beyond what we have now in Spain. So my book was a major bestseller in um, Spanish, then in Portuguese, then in French. Now it's in eight languages. If you speak Russian, Ukrainian, or Turkish, I have some copies here. And next month is coming out in German. So I'm really excited. And in two months it comes out in Chinese. The government of China is publishing my book. So I'm really excited about all these international editions. But let's go back to how we think. We evolved in the African savannas, and we think locally and linearly, but the world is changing globally and exponentially, and we have to change our mind frame, because exponential change is very fast. It's slow at the beginning, but fast later. So there is a gap, there is a growing exponential gap, and we need to be ready for this exponential change. And one of those changes, changes is how we consider aging. And more and more people are beginning to think that aging is a disease. But fortunately, a curable disease. A curable disease. In fact, in the last two decades, scientists have been able to double the life expectancy of mice. We have mice that live almost the equivalent of 200 human years. Uh, mosquitoes that live 400 human years. And worms that live the equivalent of a thousand human years. They are called the Methuselah worms, because they live the equivalent of a thousand human years. And do you think it's because scientists love worms so much that they want Methuselah worms? No, it's because we can apply this to humans. In fact, uh, Aubrey de Grey that we'll be speaking tomorrow, he's the founder of, co-founder of the Methuselah Foundation, when they created the Emprise. The Mouse Prize, the Methuselah Mouse Prize with longevity and rejuvenation objectives. But today, actually, we know even more. Uh, you know, there are immortal cells. 
And the most famous person in biology, I think, is Henrietta Lacks, who was born in 1920, and she died in 1951. She was a black American who had a cervical cancer, a huge cervical cancer. And the scientists removed that cancer and analyzed it. And they saw that the cancer kept on growing, that the cancer didn't die. And you know what? The cancer is alive today. She was born in 1920. Her cancer is alive today, 102 years old. So even though the cancer is centennial, it behaves like a teenager and it reproduces continuously. Since 1951, we know that cancer cells are biologically immortal. That doesn't mean that they don't die, because if you kill them, they die. But what is important is that they do not age. And cancer cells didn't go to Cambridge University. Did they go to MIT? Did they go to the university before? Did they go to any school? Doesn't even know how to read or write. But cancer discovered immortality. So when people tell me mortality is impossible, I say, how is it impossible? Even cancer discovered it without going to school and without spending one dollar. And it became immortal. So the proof that immortality is possible is that it already exists. It exists in biology. And not only cancer, also germ cells. Germ cells, and all of you have germ cells in your bodies. Your germ cells in your bodies do not age. Do not age. Of course, the rest of our bodies, somatic cells, age. And when we age and die, our germ cells in our bodies that do not age, they also die. But we know we have, you have immortal cells in your bodies, the germ cells, which are the most important and the most fun cells, because those are the ones for reproduction. And now we also know there are immortal animals, like hydras and some medusas, that are biologically immortal. Or even the Greeks probably discovered this, they knew that the hydras were basically immortal. But more interestingly, if we go to the beginning of life, the first life forms in the planet, bacteria that divide symmetrically do not age. They are considered biologically immortal as well. So the purpose of life is life and more life, better life. The purpose of life is not death. The purpose of life is more life. We are learning from rejuvenation technology with many animals. Why salamanders and some animals can regenerate almost every part of their body? And even humans, when we are small, we can regenerate some parts of our fingers. Please don't try this. <laughs> but this is possible. And we have a 3D printing of organs. This is just beginning. An organ transplant. And the Chinese are actually working on body transplant, full body transplant. But anyway, we don't need to go into this. We will have rejuvenation technologies. And here we have the father of all of these ideas, Aubrey de Grey, who, <laughs> who kindly wrote the prologue to my book, The Death of Death. So I'm eternally, immortally grateful to you. He began the whole field of rejuvenation technologies against the, communi the scientific community, even my alma mater, MIT, basically said that he was crazy. In the MIT Technology Review, look at him in the cover of the magazine. You know, life forever, and basically they said that, you know, this is a, a punk, a hippie. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But MIT changed, changed its mind in 14 years. By 2019, again, they covered the same issue of immortality. And look at what they said. Old age is over, if you want it. An incredible change of opinion of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I like to think about Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher who said, all truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. When Aubrey was talking about that, he was ridiculed, even by MIT. Then it was violently, violently opposed, like it is happening also to Aubrey. But then it is going to be accepted as self-evident. And remember this, in the year 2045, we will remember today, and we will remember how primitive we were today, how barbaric 
we were today that we let people die. And take pictures today because I want you to compare yourselves today when you were old and in the year 2045 when you will be young again. This is important. You need to change your mind because this will be self-evident very soon. My friend Ray Kurzweil, he talks about three bridges to immortality. In his famous book, a Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever. He talks about a bridge one in the 2010s into a bridge two now in the 2020s with biotechnology and then a final bridge three in the 2030s with nanotechnology that will take us into the 2040s with artificial intelligence, the singularity and immortality. All companies in Silicon Valley are talking about this now. Google, a few years back, they said, we are going to solve death. Because death is a technical issue and it will have a technical solution. And they created a company called Calico, California Life Company. But if you don't like Google, how about Facebook? Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan, who is a <laughs> medical doctor who studied biology at Harvard University, where they both met at Harvard, they created a foundation to prevent all diseases, to cure all diseases, including aging. We are going to cure aging. But also Microsoft, they said that we will solve cancer because now that we can sequence the genome, we will discover the mutations that stop aging in cancer, for example. There is a growing ecosystem that began with millions, now it's in the order of billions, and soon will be in the order of trillions. This will be the largest industry in the world in the next two decades. I don't know what you do, what you work on, and I don't care. If you are not into longevity, you need to begin thinking what to do in, in your future. This is, I repeat, the largest industry ever in human history. Nothing will compare to this industry. I belong to this uh, group called Longevity International. We are mapping the ecosystem, the exponentially growing ecosystem uh, of longevity throughout the planet, country by country. I am one of the leaders of the European Union on longevity. And uh, we follow people like Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, uh, this is an article from MIT Technology Review that discovered, launched uh, this information publicly that him and Yuri Milner, a famous Russian-American investor, created a company called Altos Lab. And they put $3 billion. This is the biggest funded startup in history. $3 billion to start to work on rejuvenation technologies. We have a Nobel Prize in medicine 2012. Shinya Yamanaka, who got the Nobel Prize for rejuvenating a cell. And he discovered four genes that control aging. And you can accelerate aging, stop aging, or reverse aging. We know that aging today can be reversed. Nobel Prize in Medicine 10 years ago. And another incredible scientist um, at Harvard University, David Sinclair, wrote a great book, almost as good as Aubrey de Grey's book, uh, but not as good. Uh, and he has been rejuvenating the eyes of mice. His students discovered how to rejuvenate the eyes of blind mice. We are working from cells to organs and tissues. Soon we will be rejuvenating whole bodies, animals. And Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia discovered also that this is true and they don't want to die either. So they created a foundation called Health Evolution. Evolution Foundation. And invested $1 billion per year on rejuvenation technologies. Because they discovered what Jeff Bezos has discovered. It is not useful to be the wealthiest person in the cemetery. <laughs> it is not useful to be the richest person in the cemetery. And why is this important also? Because it is the most ethical, the most moral thing you can do with your life. In human rights, in the French Revolution or at the United Nations Convention, they declared the right to life as the number one right. In fact, it should not be only one right. It's also number two and number three and number four and number five. Because if you don't have life, you don't have any rights. So this is the most ethical thing. And in advanced countries, 
90% of people die of age-related diseases. Even in Africa, over half of the people die of age-related diseases. Of course, people die of other causes. There is AIDS, there is malaria, there is climate change, there is terrorism, there is Russia, etc., etc., etc. But over half of the people in Africa die of aging. Your enemy is, our enemy is not climate change or Russia or religion. Our enemy, the common enemy of humanity is aging and death. This is the common enemy of humanity. A friend of mine, Peter Diamandis, presented at the Vatican the morality of immortality and the immorality of mortality. It is not moral to let people die. But, but sadly people will still die in the next 5 to 10 to 20 years. And for them we have plan B, which is cryonics, human cryopreservation. But I hope all of you will make it. But if not, uh, we have plan B cryonics. Um, anyway, in the future, we are going to cure all diseases. We are going to cure aging. And I plan to be younger in the future. Not because of Russian application called FaceApp. That changes your age and your sex and, and uh, your race. I could even be colored or black if I use FaceApp. But no, I want to be younger because I will be rejuvenated in the future. As Woody Allen said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. Very logical. There are four technologies that are converging and that will change humanity according to the National Science Foundation of the USA. These four technologies are nano, bio, info and cogno. Nanotechnology studies atoms. Biotechnology studies cells. These two technologies are the hardware of life, the hardware of life. And on the bottom we have infotechnology that studies bits and cognotechnology that studies neurons, which we call software. And there will be two major things happening soon, 2029 and 2045. On the hardware side, by 2029, to 2030, Ray Kurzweil says that we will reach the Methuselarity, the singularity of Methuselah, or longevity escape velocity. What does it mean? That if we make it to 2030, for every year we survive, we gain another extra year and a little bit more of life. Because life expectancy keeps on increasing. So if we make it to 2030, we will have basically lived long enough to live forever, almost, but aging, aging, until 2045, when we will have rejuvenation technologies, and we will become younger, immortally younger for as long as you want. That on the hardware side. On the software side below, according to Ray Kurzweil, by 2029 we will pass the Alan Turing test. And you will not know anymore if you are talking to a human or if you are talking to a machine. Actually, do you know if I am a human? <laughs> by 2029, you will not know it. You will not know it. And then by 2045, we will reach the technological singularity. An artificial intelligence superior to the intelligence of all humans. On top of that, we have virtual worlds that are appearing. Things that we will be creating, as probably you saw in the future by, in the movie, uh, Ready Player One by Steven Spielberg. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It happens in the year 2045, the year of the singularity, uh, Steven Spielberg. But we have to be careful about this meta, because some people say it can be the meta perverse. Not the metaverse, but the meta perverse. Anyway, all of this to see the future we call transhumanism, which is the traditional humanism with science and technology. Transhumanism is humanism plus science and technology that will allow us to transcend human limitations. We have many human limitations. We have biological limitations, physical limitations, linguistic limitations. 
all kinds of limitations, but thanks to technology, we will transcend these limitations. In fact, who thinks that we are at the end of evolution? We evolved in Africa, and we, we kept on mutating, and we keep on mutating and changing and evolving. We are not the end of evolution. We are actually only the beginning of technological evolution. In fact, we are trans monkeys. We evolved from other monkeys before us. So we are trans monkeys. And there will be trans humans. We will continue evolution, but not biologically. We will have technological evolution, but carefully, carefully. <laughs> we don't want to finish like that. <laughs> Our species is called Homo sapiens sapiens, and this is very important. What does Homo sapiens sapiens mean? The human that knows, that knows. We are the only species that knows, that knows. Actually, we are the only major species, with other three that I will mention, that self-recognizes itself in the mirror. You know, we humans recognize on the mirror. Dogs do not recognize on the mirrors. Cats do not recognize on mirrors. Only other monkeys, elephants, and dolphins. Dolphins, monkeys, and um, elephants recognize on the mirror. Um, and humans, of course, humans. Anyway, this is called transhumanism because humanity is still evolving. We humans evolved in Africa. We separated from other monkeys eight, six million years ago. The human age has lasted only in this shape and form, only for about a hundred, maybe two hundred thousand years. And we keep on evolving, but now we do it technologically. This is what transhumanism is about. We are not the end of evolution. We are just the beginning of technological evolution. And we are nothing in the history of the planet, nothing. If you look at the top, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs ruled the planet for 200 million years. 200 million years. We are here for only 200,000 years. We are nothing even compared to the dinosaurs. And if you go further back, bacteria. Bacteria appeared three and a half billion years ago. And remember that the first bacteria that divide symmetrically do not age. Do not age. The first life forms in the planet do not biologically age. So what will happen in the future? Fantastic. I recommend that you look for an incredible video, eight minutes long, Intro to Transhumanism, where we talk about the three pillars of transhumanism. Super longevity, which is basically immortality. Super intelligence, which is basically super, super intelligence, the singularity, and super well-being. We humans represent only a small possibility of different life forms. There are many other life forms possible. And we will be reaching those stages through transhumanism. In fact, we will modify our hardware and software internally and externally. Ray Kurzweil talks about six epochs in the future. Well, in the history and future of humanity. The first epoch when physics and chemistry appear. The second epoch, biology. The third, brains. The fourth, technology. We are on the fifth epoch, the merge of technology and humanity. And finally, we will transcend and we will wake up the universe. Remember these four technologies and the two key years, 2029 and 2045. So, just to wrap up the things, we have to meditate about the future. I love meditation. We have to think about how we are transcending the limited human condition today. Because there is always yin and yang, as the Chinese say. And the yin yang is so complex that yin yang on the right has little yin yang. And inside even little, little yin yang. So we have to be careful about the dark side of the force, the dark side. And so let me show you this picture of the world at dark. And the Chinese have a fantastic phrase. They say, let's not blame darkness. Instead, let's light up a candle. To illuminate the planet, let's light up a candle with the incredible possibilities of the future. Because there are two possibilities in the future. And you can see Korea. I lived three years in Tokyo, in Japan. And I went a lot to Korea. And once to North Korea. 
which is the darkest country in the world. While South Korea is the most illuminated country probably, with the best internet in Asia, North Korea is the last country in the planet without public internet. The same Koreans, the same people, with the same food, with the same religion, with the same history. But South Korea is moving into the future and North Korea is going backwards into the past. Where do you want to go? To the future or to the past? Because remember, we live in magical times, in the most incredible times ever in human history. We are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. Where do you want to be? You want to be one of the last stupid people who die? And I finish with this beautiful Chinese phrase that I learned in Japan. This Chinese word that I began to draw, first I did it upside down or sideways, now I do it right. This Chinese word has two characters and it means crisis. Crisis in Chinese has two characters. The first character is danger. Danger. But the second character is opportunity. We are in the middle of a crisis with a lot of danger, of course. But the greatest opportunity ever in human history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Amazing. Amazing.